You're listening to Profit Boss Radio. I'm Hillary Hendershot, your host, and this is episode 79. Profit Boss Radio is your weekly wealth mastermind. Profit Boss is also a community and a movement for women who are ready to take control of their money, break the glass ceiling, and give ourselves permission to finally have enough. Want the secrets of wealth to be yours? This is the place. I'm Hillary Hendershot. I'm a certified financial planner running a leading advisory firm for women, and I'm sharing with you real stories from real life and real women who are making it happen. Forget Wall Street. Let's do this, ladies. Death and dying. Well, now there's something we don't talk about a lot. We don't talk about it a lot on this podcast, and frankly, we don't talk about it a lot in life. My guest today is on a mission to have people face their mortality for their own benefit and for the benefit of the people that love them, and that includes you. We don't like to think about death and dying, but the fact remains, this human life is not an eternal one, and there really is a lot you can do to ease the suffering of your loved ones by taking the time to think through and document what's important to you about your own health care. I'm sure many of you listening have already been in the position of having to make end-of-life care decisions for someone, and it's a really hard thing to do. Statistically speaking, it's unlikely that you felt you had 100% of the information you needed in order to make choices that were aligned with what your loved one would have wanted if he or she couldn't fully communicate for themselves at that time. So after today's episode, please consider taking the time to talk through these issues with your spouse, with your parents, with the people you're closest to. Even if you have an advanced directive, the people who love you still won't fully understand what you want. The more fully you communicate, the easier it'll be for everyone to respect your wishes. And communicating can save money. Some families continue medical treatments long past the point where they're helpful just because they really don't know what their loved one would have wanted. That's really emotionally and financially expensive and really unnecessary. So consider picking up a copy of Debbie's guide, which is called The Blueprint to Age Your Way by going to hillaryhendershot.com forward slash 79 and linking from there to purchase them on Amazon. One is a book and one is a workbook. Here's more about Debbie. Debbie Pearson is a registered nurse. She spent more than 40 years caring for others as a hospital nurse, a home health care nurse, a case manager, and a court-appointed guardian. She founded Nurses Case Management in 2000 for to advocate for people who could no longer care for themselves due to age, injury, or illness. And her first book, Age Your Way, tells the stories of her experiences while caring for people who couldn't care for themselves anymore during a period where others made decisions and did the best that they could to guess at what the patient wanted. For many, this period of dependence spans years or decades. She knew there had to be a better way, a way to put patients in control. The blueprint to age your way was developed from the system she uses with her own patients to gather their information and document their wishes, all documented in advance to be used at the time when they're no longer able to control their own care by the spoken word. The blueprint becomes their personalized roadmap, a guide for others to follow. And here are some excerpts from some of the all all five-star reviews on Amazon for Debbie's book. This book should be required reading for anyone who values making their own decisions and loving their family well. This book is a good, easy read with resources and action steps. I was blown away by what a valuable resource the blueprint for aging your way is. I called my parents and my grandparents and I asked them each to get a copy so we can talk about it at our family reunion this spring. All throughout my time of working with clients and caregivers, I hear frequently, there's no handbook for this stuff. Well, now there is. Please enjoy my lovely conversation with Debbie Pearson about communicating your end of life wishes. Debbie, welcome to Profit Boss Radio. Thank you for having me. Now, you are on quite a mission. Would you say a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today? I am a registered nurse, and I have been in the field of nursing for over 40 years, which provides me with this huge abundance of patient stories. It's the 
wonderful enlightening stories and then the cautionary stories that did not go well for people's lives. And so that is my mission is to take the good, the bad and the ugly and put it out there for people to make some conscious decisions and actually grab hold of their aging years instead of hiding their eyes. Now, what does it look like to grab hold of your aging years? It actually is making eye contact with the third third of your life. And that comes out of all of us living so many more years than we may have ever expected. And we do a tremendous amount of very enthusiastic and active planning for so many other stages like where we're going to go to school, what we're going to do for work, all the planning for having a baby or getting married. And we plan our lives and we're active in our lives until, for many of us, the third third of our lives, which may be 60 to 90, we just let go of it and don't do anything as opposed to looking at it and saying, these are the parts of my aging years that I want control over. Mm. And I mm. want, want control over them even if I lose my ability to communicate my wishes. I still want to control them. Now, what are some of the things you saw happen that led you to take up this mantle? I have seen everything from 20-year-old college children that are adults but they're still children be head injured or spinal cord injured, where they will have the rest of their lives to live on life support or not, and no one ever asked the questions, all the way to people with advancing dementia or Parkinson's or a sudden stroke, where all of a sudden they're getting ready to retire and they're 64 years old and They thought that they would spend their retirement years traveling, and instead, they're spending their retirement years with someone else making decisions for them that they never communicated what they want or what they don't want. So, you know, you have a really unique perspective as a member of the healthcare community. I think maybe people have some misconceptions about the medical system. What are what are some of the most common misconceptions that you run into? People think that this is true, but it's really not or vice versa. One of the things has to do with legal documents where People will do their legal documents, not many, it's the minority that actually have legal documents executed for their advanced directives, but where people will take the time and do their advanced directives and they'll name a power of attorney for health care and they will fill out either a living will or directive to physician that says, if I'm in an irreversible or incurable condition, I want either everything done or put me on comfort care for hospice. And they think that takes care of things. And it really doesn't because it's almost like every condition we have, you can be supported for a number of years and it can be decades. I mean, it's the Terry Schiavo case where people can be left on life support and alive for decades And they think their legal documents take care of that, but they really don't. The legal documents don't care, take care of it. And just naming a power of attorney doesn't take care of it. What actually makes this happen the way you would want or I would want is if we put a written plan in place and we involve the person that we've named as our agent and they understand what our wishes are and what that does It keeps them from making decisions and wrestling with the decisions for us. And instead, with a documented guide, what they can do is just apply our wishes. And they don't have the guilt involved with it. And they don't have to wrestle. They bring out the piece of paper that says, you know, this is the type of respiratory support I want or don't want. This is the type of nutritional support do I want to be on dialysis for failed kidneys? And it la- it lists every single thing. So your agent, if they're involved, 
they just follow your formula. I know my mother has said to me and my sister and her husband probably 20 times how she does not want to be kept alive on life support. And I think this is her way of involving us. She wants to, I mean, my mom was in the healthcare field, so she probably knows some of this. And I mean, it's hard to hear. I don't want to be in that position to make that decision for her. But, you know, I'm pretty clear that she doesn't want to be kept alive on life support. And so that's her way of fulfilling on this, right? Yes, but I'll tell you, healthcare is a little bit more complicated than that because even doing, you know, let's say someone has a bad heart attack and they need stenting or bypass surgery, that can be construed as a medical necessity or it can be construed as life support. So the devil's in the details here. Mm. And those are the things that in the moment of crisis, when you are upset and the doctor's saying, yes, but if we do this, we can pull her through, you can, can typically be too emotional to step back and make the decision. So it is about writing it down. Well, and you, you have to climb a wall of resistance with people, don't you? I mean, my experience is people don't want to face their own mortality and getting them to sit down and think about it and make decisions about these things can be close to impossible. It is. And especially when people are starting to fail in their health, like if you sat down and did it today, it would be relatively straightforward for you. Maybe not because you're quite a bit younger, but let's say someone who's 50, Mm -hmm. it would be pretty straightforward. Their kids have grown up, they've gone to college, they're doing okay, and then they can make selfish decisions as to how they want to live or don't live. And yet when that person turns 70 and they're starting to have some symptoms of their Parkinson's or coronary artery disease or whatever it is that they're declining and they're not able to be as active, then they start being afraid and functioning from a point of fear. So what I have found the very best thing is for the active generation to start doing their plan and talking about it with their parents as they're doing it, going through some of the chapters, going through some of the written parts and just going through it with family members and it is kind of like just setting a good example. When you say going through it, you're talking about your book and the accompanying workbook? Yes, the workbook and either mine or anyone else's workbook that they have out there for planning for aging. And there's a wonderful organization called the Conversation Project that's out there And that is end of life wishes. And it is incredibly important. It's a nationwide program. And that takes care of those last months beautifully. But what I have seen is so many of my patients, we are taking care of them for decades. And there are a lot of other decisions like, do you want to be in your home with care when you can't function on your own, or do you want to go to a retirement community or assisted living, or what will be your concessions when the doctor says you can't drive anymore? So there are are decades of decisions to think through and make concessions on and give someone other than yourself guidance on that. So it's not just end-of-life care. Are people sometimes afraid that if they name someone to make decisions on their behalf, that that person and the doctor will actually do something that would end their life when they could have recovered? I mean, do people not take action because they fear they're giving up control and the possibility of a positive outcome? What would you say to those people? I would tell them that the best way to exert control is to have it in writing and share that with more than one person. If you share it with one person and they decide to go rogue, then yeah, that would be a fear, especially if you don't trust that person. But sharing it with multiple people in your inner circle where they all see it, they all know where it is. Of course, there's so much information that it has to be kept in a secured location 
But if there are multiple people that see and hear the same information, then it's very hard for someone to divert from that. I know with my own family, I started my career in ICU and worked there back in the 70s when every single patient who came to the ICU, they were a full CPR And it didn't matter if they were 100 years old and 80 pounds. If they wound up in the ICU and their heart stopped, we would do CPR on them. That was the standard of care in critical care back in the 70s. Or they didn't belong in ICU. And I can't tell you how many people I was doing chest compressions, cracking ribs, and saying, this is not right. This couldn't possibly be what this person wanted. But no one asked them back then. So... The important thing is to make sure your family members or your inner circle know, because I've had very bad osteoporosis since my 30s. It was just an inherited condition. And so last year I told my husband and my three children and their three spouses when we did our planning meeting, I said, I do not ever want CPR. And a year later, they are still trying to talk me out of that saying, well, what if you choke in a restaurant? And it's like, this is my wish as a nurse of over 40 years and the experience I've had and knowing my own body. This is my wish. And they all know it. So I feel comforted that they all know that that is a very, very strong wish of mine. And no one's going to allow that to happen because I have all the documents in place and everyone's been told the same thing. Well, specifically with CPR, I mean, very few people are revived by CPR. Isn't that right? I feel like I'm I'm completely out of my element now. But isn't it true that if you're in a position where you actually need CPR, that survival is unlikely? Especially out of the hospital. And I don't know what it is in Texas, but I know, I mean, in California, but in Texas, there's an out-of-hospital CPR that says if you are out of the hospital – and your heart stops. This is if you're in your own home or a nursing home or assisted living. There's a state form that you fill out that stops EMS from doing CPR. And the reason for that is it is a fraction of 1% of people who are out of the hospital and need CPR and that ever return to their pre CPR functioning level. Tiny, tiny percentage. Now, I, I don't have personal experience of someone I know being injured and incapacitated, but I can say that in my financial planning business, I've had clients who were in their 80s and 90s, and they start to show the signs of cognitive decline. And at that point, if I haven't done the proper planning, excuse, if they haven't done the proper planning, I'm in a position where, you know, I have to start calling their children or other family members because it's time to start thinking about what's going to happen if this person becomes unable to make decisions for themselves, you know, or worse. I mean, what if they start making decisions that put someone in danger, right? Did you know that people with a written financial plan are 60% more likely to increase their savings over time and twice as likely to stick to their savings plan than those who don't accomplish the simple step of just writing it down? Yet just 24% of Americans say they have a wealth plan in writing. I want us to change those statistics and I've got an offer for you that's going to make it as easy as one, two, three for you to get your wealth plan in order. The first step to having a wealth plan is taking stock of what's already there. You have to know your net worth. You have to know where you're starting from in order to get to your destination. And knowing what your financial life looks like at a glance is the key. You can use a financial dashboard to manage your wealth plan, and I am giving you free access to the same financial dashboard I use with my most successful clients. A financial dashboard allows you to track your bank accounts, categorize your spending, track real estate and mortgages, including even knowing the difference between principal and interest, and your investments and your credit cards, and see it all at one place and at your fingertips. I think we can all agree that having one location, both on the web and on your mobile device, to view your entire financial picture saves you time and frustration. It also empowers you to take control. This is an exclusive offer for the Profit Boss audience. To take advantage, just go to hillaryhendershot.com forward slash emoney. 
This is the same technology I make available to my comprehensive financial planning clients. It has superior security with 256-bit secure socket layer encryption. They literally have a team of security experts trying to hack the system at all times, but no one has ever succeeded, and it's a VeriSign secure site. The portal itself is totally non-transactional, so no one can move, withdraw, or access your money. It just puts all the same data that's already online in one place so you can see it. You input your various passwords and those are kept private and only ever accessible to you, sort of like mint.com, but with a lot more planning power. Full disclosure, I am the advisor behind the scenes. My team and I could potentially run across your account balances. Those are visible to the folks at mint.com or personal capital or any other financial dashboard app you might be using. And I'm here because I truly want you to be successful and I'm not going to do wrong by you. You can trust me and my team to safeguard your information. Having a wealth plan in place is one of the seven key steps to wealth and the e-money financial dashboard is a powerful tool that makes that possible. Once you're logged in, interactive workshop tools can help you see how changes in savings and investments today affect your future retirement goals, and that really puts you in the driver's seat. I'm proud to offer you this tool, and I hope you take advantage of it now. To request access, please go to hillaryhendershot.com forward slash eMoney. And so at that point, is it too late? Typically it is, because in the legal documents, It needs to name someone who can act either immediately or begin having that role of responsible party when you are incapacitated. But the truth is there's a period of time where you fluctuate in and out of capacity that on a good day, you know everything. And on a bad day, you know, you can't find your way to your bathroom. And that has to do with lots of medical conditions that create that variation. But the best thing is to have named agents that can act and to also tell your attorney and your financial planner and your physician that these people can be contacted at any time. It's like signing the HIPAA release Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. release medical. I really think we need to have a release of information for financial planners and for attorneys that you don't have to wait until you're incapacitated, but that the family is involved where our attorney at any time can talk to any of our children. We've signed the release and we've told them that when we're in that gray area that can last on and off for years, a long time, they, they can contact and our financial planner as well. He can contact our children and talk to them because I've worked with people who have relinquished their entire future that was going to support their aging years, they have relinquished that to all these scammers that come and say they're going to care for them. Yeah, they're going to care for their checkbook. And when it's gone, they go away and there's nothing left. And that really is when your team of trusted advisors can be of great value because you have a team of professionals who are educated and on a, you know and and have their technical expertise but also know you know your wishes know your values and can act and help make decisions and plan on your behalf. Yes. And also if you as a financial planner have that release that says you don't have to wait for incapacity but you have a release should you have any concerns you may talk to these two children of mine who I trust. Don't talk to the third one who is an absolute wreck, but it's like the hip release. It's a financial release. These are the people I trust and you can talk to them because if you have to wait for them to go through the medical system and the court system to be adjudicated as incapacitated, they could be penniless at that point. Right. So I was on your blog and I saw an article that you wrote recently. And I think many of the people listening might think that this conversation is only about taking care of themselves and maybe their parents. But can you talk about what recently happened with your grandson so my listeners can understand how far reaching this is? Yes. And I'm in the planning business and I didn't do this right. So it just goes to show you it doesn't matter how experienced you think you are, you are only experienced with what you have seen and what you have touched. My, he was 19. This happened in March of this year. My 19 year old grandson had a very traumatic injury that included many 
body injuries, internal injuries, injuries of all his limbs, everything broken, and a head injury. And he wound up in, we have a wonderful trauma center in Austin. He wound up at the trauma center where they were starting to apply all of the procedures they needed to to stabilize him. And by the time they got his mother's number and got her in the e- ER, I the way I say it is she arrived in the ER with tears and fears. Mm-hmm. She did mm-hmm. not arrive with anything that she needed to have because at 19, he's an adult. They would not give her information. They wouldn't let her help guide them. Nothing. It was as though she was a stranger walking into that ER and seeing her son. And what it told me is every 18 year old needs a birthday gift that says, I'm not giving you the check or the keys to the new car until you execute your legal documents. Wow. So has your grandson done that at this point? He has. But that's that's a very scary situation. I mean, he is a college student. They couldn't even withdraw him from college. They couldn't do anything until he was able to be conscious enough to give a verbal authorization. But then they had no legal documents to do any of that. So that was taken care of, you know, after he was out of the intensive care and started recovering enough where his brain injury We had to get him tested neurologically for him to pass his neuropsych testing to say he could execute documents. And that was months. Really? Now, the testing, is that medically demanded? He had a head injury. So they say you have to you have to demonstrate that you can make decisions before we'll allow you to make decisions for yourself. In his, his case, yes, people may not be that stringent. But why not take care of it ahead of time? Oh, my gosh. That must have been just so scary. It was horrible. I mean, it takes a traumatic event and just pours gasoline and lights a match to it. Right. Right. Devastating. And and has he recovered? He has. Beautiful. He has. He, is, he finally ditched his cane and his splints and his cast. And the plan is for him to go back to college in the fall. Oh my gosh, this was a very severe injury. Yeah, he fell three floors onto (gasps) concrete from three stories. So if you're going to do that, be 19 and be very, very strong. Oh my goodness, yes. (laughs) I'm so glad to hear he's recovering. Amazing. Okay, so I know legal documents can get really specific and detailed. So do these documents have to be approved or reviewed by an attorney or anything? That is always my recommendation. First of all, that you do legal documents that are legal in your state and they vary state to state. You can go online and I would rather have someone go online and get their state approved documents and do that than nothing. But there are a lot of subtleties with legal documents and I'm a huge proponent of using an attorney in your state so that all the legal documents are up to date and they're done where they will hold up in court if someone goes and questions them. So that's my recommendation. But I know some people are not interested in bearing the cost and the time involved. So go online and get what is legal in your state and do it. Because we all have one of three stages to plan. And if you wait too long, you can't do it on your own. I mean, You and I right now are stage one where we could put together a plan that says exactly what we want. We can distribute it to the people we want, and it can be a very valid plan. But you wait too long and you start declining either mentally or physically. Then you go to stage two where you can direct a plan, but you certainly can't find your insurance documents and the deed to your house and all of your bank accounts and your safety deposit box. You can't do all of that independently because either mentally or physically, it's become too burdensome. So you need to get a helper to go through the execution of your plan. And at the end, that can be a plan that really reflects who you are and what you want. But that takes more involvement. Or you can wait till stage three, which is 
so many of my patients. I have my company, Nurses Case Management, is also a guardianship program, and we will be assigned people who have wound up in the probate court with no one to speak for them or make decisions or a family that's fighting about them so much that the court steps in and they will name us as their guardian of the person to make all of their personal and medical decisions for them. And we may not even know what their wishes are. Because they haven't documented them or or talked with anyone about them. Absolutely. So I think people have heard the term medical directive. So is the information in your book and workbook, is that, does that take the place of a medical directive or how, how do those jive? What it does is it is a guide for both your financial power of attorney and your medical power of attorney to have a resource to follow. You still have to have somebody who has the legal authority to act. And I think we've all had that where we have the legal authority, but what about the ethical imperative to move this person's life forward in a way that they want it moved forward? So the planning book is a resource for your legally appointed advocate. So it does not take the place of a medical directive. It does not. The medical directive is simply the document that says, this is the person I name to act on my behalf. No, that's your medical power of attorney. So once you have a power of attorney named, the directive says, if I am in an irreversible or incurable position medically, I either want to go on life support or I don't. And that's typically the extent of a medical directive or living will. It's just for end stage, critical, do I want life support or not? And that's as shallow as it is. So a real documented plan goes many, many layers deeper so that the individual can answer all the other questions. So what people should do if they're listening is they should get a copy of the book and they should get a copy for their spouse and their parents and their kids who are 18 or over and go through the questions with those people. Is that right? Yes. And really for 18 or older, typically all they need is just what I call the advanced directives. And that's the medical power of attorney, the durable power of attorney for finances, the HIPAA release, And then the directive to physicians. So 18-year-olds don't have as complex a life. But let's say, you know, heaven forbid your husband dies tomorrow. Do you know where all his bank accounts are? Do you know where every single thing in his life is? Do you know every password he has? You know, what do you know about him to take over his life? And you may think you know it, but no one knows all of the little bitty pieces of someone else's life. So for an 18-year-old, if they can just do their advanced directives, those four documents, that's plenty for them. But once you get older and you have more complexity in your life and you have a spouse and you have children, that's where you need the detail. Now, now, what about passwords? I certainly don't know my husband's passwords and he doesn't know mine. Should we be sharing that information? Well, that's one of the chapters in the book is to write down your logins and your passwords because like we didn't have my grandson's login and password to his school to even go in there and put his classes on hold. So, you know, I mean, there's so many things that you need that what my husband and I do, we have uh, an electronic one password that we use and we have every password and everything in there and we know each other's password to get into the, you know, 110 passwords that we each have. I use one password as well. So I could give my husband the password to that and then he would have everything, but he doesn't use one password. He memorizes his passwords. So that's a bigger problem. (laughs) It's a huge problem. You know, and even things like, If something were to happen to your mother, you know, do you know what plumber she uses that knows her house? Do you know where, which exterminator? Do you know, 
you know, the back office line to her doctor where it can get through to the nurse. There's just there's so many service providers and pieces of information, especially with the parent. If they're not living with you, they have a world of things that are going on in their life that you do not know. I mean, my father died 10 years ago and I'm still getting Facebook from him because I didn't know his Facebook password. Oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah, I just got a just got a post from him. It's always fascinating to see him pop back up there again. <laughs> well, you're being light about it, but that could be kind of upsetting. It it was it was very upsetting for a number of years. He he took his own life and it was very very hard at the beginning. That was his choice. I've over time come to terms with that as his choice. And it's good that I can laugh when I get a Facebook from him now. Yes, it is. That's very grown up of you. I'm sorry that that happened. So we're going to leave people with a link to get a copy of your book. And I think this has been a very meaningful conversation on a topic that people really don't want to face. And so I think the moral of the story is planning ahead is the best kind of planning, right? Because there is no planning in the moment. Yes, that's true. Debbie, thank you for your time. I'm so grateful for this conversation on a very important topic and we'll make sure to send people your way. Now, outside of the book, is there another way people can reach or contact you or or find what you're publishing and, and talking about? Yes, anyone can go to ageyourway.com and sign up on the website for the blogs if they need any speaking engagements, they can contact me for any speaking because really what works well is to get with a group of people, present the topic, and then have the dialogue of questions and answers. So it would all be done through ageyourway.com or they can email me directly at debbie at ageyourway.com. Beautiful. Thanks, Debbie. Have a fantastic day. Thanks. Bye-bye.